Alright, thank you. Welcome everyone, good evening. Welcome to Demo Day Class 6 for our sixth group of startups of Incubate. Uh, thanks very much for coming down tonight. Um, we have had a couple of problems with audio, so if it does cut out, just bear with us. Uh, but it should be good, we've got the best guys on it. Um, a very special welcome, first and foremost, to our distinguished guests, our sponsors, and our mentors who are here tonight. Um, my name is James Alexander, and I'm the program manager for Incubate, and I'll be your host this evening. We're really, really excited to see what you guys have to think about our six class of startups. Um, we think the fantastic group of founders tackling some diverse problems, so we're really interested to see how that goes. Okay, first of all, a bit of house cleaning. If you're on social, and I hope most of you are, if you're here at a pitch night for the startups, um, please do uh, use our hashtags, um, class six, if you want to talk about the startups, Lenovo, Innovate, um, and if you use those, we'll be able to pick them up and share. Um, otherwise, tweet at us, Sydney Incubate, or even myself, James A. Sid, um, and we can continue the conversation after this event. So tonight, you're going to see eight startups pitching. And it's been quite a journey because we started Incubate about three years ago, and now we've helped 48 startup founders from Sydney University. And we call them founders because, as you can see here, we believe that they're founding and building high potential technology companies, and they're doing it um, to build globally, potentially globally, and hopefully competitive products and services. In fact, this one is Atlas, who you'll be seeing pitching later tonight. And that's them building the um, ROV. I got sent that on a Saturday night, um, asking what I was doing <laughs> while they were in the, in the incubator hub. Put simply, incubator backs students and researchers that want to build products and services for the future. That's, that's an <laughs> But this is all possible because we've got a really great team. And like any other startup, um, let me introduce our team. There's myself, there's Joe, who's the director of student programs, there's Shane Burke, our in house mentor. Uh, Lizette, our newest addition, our community events manager, Farid, our project coordinator. If you want to get involved in any way, please just come find any of us afterwards and we're happy to have a chat. <laughs> also, Incubate's made possible by our partners. First and foremost, our longest running industry partner, um, which was previously Nikta, now Data61, part of CSIRO. Uh, we're really excited to be partnering with them. Our program partner, University of Sydney, and our latest and principal sponsor of 2015, Lenovo. Now, Lenovo came on board for our class six startups. As you can see here, they've got some pretty awesome gear. Um, we gave them gear, but we also, part of the deal was to try and get some exposure. And if you jump on YouTube, we've actually got some interviews with all the founders tonight about what they're doing. And I even managed to jump on Sky News with some Lenovo, which was quite a lot of fun. Um, but here to talk about that, and why they're involved with incubator and startups. I'd like to introduce the leader of consumer tech in Asia and the managing director of Lenovo Australia and New Zealand. Please welcome Matt Quagunji. Hello, can you hear me? That sound on? Awesome. Thank you very much, James. And, and thank you very much to the incubator team. I think it's been a, a great success over the past period, and this year's no exception to that. So I know you guys have come along tonight, and you're here to celebrate and recognise the achievements of the team, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I'll tell you that, um, for those of you who haven't met Matt Coddington, uh, Lenovo Managing Director, I've been exposed to a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in my time. I've lived in Asia, I've lived in Singapore, I've lived in Hong Kong, I've lived in Japan and Tokyo for the last five years. And for me, this is a very exciting program. I'll tell you that um, you know, in my career, most recently with Incubate, I've seen the best of Australia. I've seen um, things through my work with the Digital Careers uh, Forum. I've seen things through the STEM panels that I'm on. Um, I've seen things through Lenovo itself here. We're doing a lot of stuff. And Lenovo has this mantra which is never stand still. It's a bit of a marketing tag, I guess, but it really encapsulates, I think, what we're about. We're just not complacent. And it's, you know, these sorts of programs are very important to us to, to drive. Um, I'd say to you that one of the biggest challenges we have in Australia right now is local talent, fostering local talent, driving innovation locally. We've had the 
the boom and the, I guess, the slowdown of the resources um, sector. Um, you know, our economies, we look, you know, two, three, four years out, um, we need to invest. We need to invest in innovation. We all know that. Uh, I think, you know, as, an oblig as, a, as, a, as a corporate, we have an obligation to invest in that. We have an obligation to step up and put our money where our mouth is. We have access to resources. We have access to people. We have access to, um, you know, technology. And for us, I think that's what it's what it's all about in this forum. I think governments have an obligation to this. Uh, most recently, you heard the Innovation Minister Christopher Pine um, commit to the national uh, what's called National Innovation Agenda. Yeah, and that's all about setting us up, ourselves up for the future. It's about bringing industry and research and universities together for success. So we'll be supporting that. Um, as I look at Lenovo as a company, um, we're probably, I would say we're one of the innovation leaders in the technology sector. Um, we have a rich history and a track record of innovation. If I look at the past couple of years, we have over 100 uh, awards for design and innovation. Uh, this year we'll spend $730 million in research and development. We've got a very rich talent pool of um, designers and developers and engineers and scientists. Um, and really for us it's about, you know, we've got over 13,000 globally recognised patents, we've got over 5,000 of them based in invention. A lot of them come out of Japan. So, you know, Lenovo is, is about driving that, that level of innovation. Um, we've been working with the Incubate team, with James and the Incubate team, and, and um, providing, I guess, support in many different ways. One of those ways is, um, you've heard tonight, with provision of technology. Uh, we've given these guys some laptops and tablets and other stuff, and, and they've used them quite inventively, actually. You know, they've used them in ways I haven't initially intended, but that's okay. Um, some of them have used them. We've, we've got a, a, a big gaming laptop. They've used that for video editing on the go. They've used that for digital content creation. The tablets are around you know, end user verification, end user validation, those sorts of things. So it's been a good investment. And I'm pleased to say that we're, you know, we're committed to the coming year in FY1617 and we're continuing to support uh, Innovate next year. So that's exciting for us. But it's not going to stop there either. Um, we're going to introduce the Lenovo um, Award, Lenovo, I've got the name, what was it? Choice Award. Choice, choice Award, excellent. That's the one thing I had to talk about tonight was Lenovo Choice Award. There it is. Lenovo Choice Award. And this is, is it's been that never stand still spirit. It's about the most creative, the most innovative, um, and probably the most commercially viable <laughs> opportunity as well that's coming to market. That award is it's about ten thousand, it's over ten thousand dollars worth of hardware product to really take the team on the next steps in their journey. So we'll be awarding that to a team tonight. I'm very excited about tonight. There's a lot of potential in the room. Um, I tell you that, you know, as I look at, um, I guess Incubate's role, it's very, very important to bring the education sector close to the business, the outcomes we're looking for. Um, I think you know business needs to step up and be represented as well, and I hope that's what we're doing. But it's also up to you guys as well. Um, it's about you as a, as, a, as a, I guess, as a community, making sure that you're spreading the word so that people have the ideas you know, to step into this sort of environment. That's the way we drive the innovation. It's about you guys spreading the word to the business and community leaders, of course. I think we need to step up and do that. Um, but really getting those guys to have the ideas into this sort of um, incubation forum, most important. So with that, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the pictures tonight. I think they're going to be great. And I'll hand over the stage to the stars of the show, the incubation tips. Thank you. Great. Thanks, so. All right. Now, these are the eight startups you're going to be seeing tonight. Um, we already believe that the products that they've created already have lasting value, not just economic potential and that there's value in what they're actually trying to do. And they're trying to solve real problems and trying to bring solutions into the market. For those of you that don't know, um, our startups have been through a really refined 14-week accelerator program. Um, it's been refined over the last three years, um, and we're at the very end of it right now. For any investors in the room or representatives, all our startups are traction in some form, but you'll see that in a second. Um, typically, they're going to be raising their first seed financing round within six months, and we've seen anything from 300 to 1.5 million. We're looking for experienced founders 
and early stage investors with industry experience. And we've seen angels invest anywhere personally between 50 to 200,000. Um, so this is the type of angels that we see. And as, as I said before, everyone in this, everyone pitching tonight um, will be raising their first round or have a just raised their first round. Tonight's format is eight startups, five minutes each, followed by questions from our esteemed panel. Um, let me introduce our esteemed panel, starting off with Petra, uh, the Director of ATP Innovations, Michelle Dika, founder and CEO of One Ventures, and Natasha Rowling, CEO of Head of Appeals. Can we please give them a very warm welcome? It's great to have um, an all female panel. I wouldn't usually um, uh, take note of that, but today I've been told on Twitter that it is Ada Lovelace Day. For those of you who don't know Ada Lovelace, you should definitely go up. Um, it's celebrating women in STEM roles. <laughs> Okay, enough of me talking. Let's get to the startups. Can I please welcome Matthew from High Flow on stage? Oh, testing, testing. Ah, here we go. Thank you, James. Thank you, Matt, for introducing us tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Matthew. I am co founder of High Flow, and our mission is to bring all of the hiring into one place. And the reason why I'm here speaking about hiring tonight is because we all know it's incredibly painful. And we've all experienced it, whether we be on the hiring side or we're the ones being hired. When I was going through customer interviews and discussing this problem of hiring managers, one of them told us that he received so many applications that he only looks at the first 20 and throws out the rest. Think about that for a second. That's over 80, 100 applications, 80 over 100 applicants who are not having their application looked at. And that really shows the problem in the market today. We're optimizing for quality or we're optimizing for time, never both. And we can see this reflected in the market. In Australia, HR spending is 11.1 billion Australian dollars. Globally, it's 619 billion dollars, US dollars. And yet, and yet, we still see this average turnover of employees roughly around 15%, which is significant considering how much is being spent on this problem. There's been significant uptake of technologies in order to try and alleviate this, and we see some best-in-class solutions spring up. The issue is that they're not appealing to the key players in the market, the applicant or the HR manager or the companies themselves. They only appeal to one of the three. Worse yet, though data is incredibly silent, meaning that data migration and hence the friction between is incredibly hard to do. So this is where higher flow comes in. We strongly believe that in order to encourage more employers to use these best in class technologies and in order to improve the hiring process, we want to integrate all these services into one platform. That way, employers can pick and choose the exact technologies they want to use and that way, they can better screen, better interview, and better hire, thereby solving this issue of optimizing for either time or quality. So an example might be, if you're hiring for a developer and you don't know how to hire for a developer, you don't have any coding experience, just plug in HackerRank, and it'll screen the applicants so that you know that the people you're interviewing have those developer skills. The results have been significant. Based on the higher flows usage, Many of our partner companies have been able to reduce their process by one less interview. Using industry standard figures, that's a $10,000 saving per hire. Going back, back to that 15% employee turnover, that's $150,000 saved per year. And that's really exciting. Not only are we improving the hiring process just by letting employers use these technologies, we're saving them a significant amount of money. So our business model is simple. We know that small businesses don't hire all the time, so we offer them a free applicant tracking system, as well as access to our other in-house technologies such as screening, video interviewing, and what I'm really excited about is reverse video interviewing. Please come see me at the booth afterwards if you want to know more about that. And we take a 10 percent clip on any integration such as posting a seat, posting to HackerRank that they choose to do. Medium-sized businesses, 10 jobs, $200 a month, and as they grow larger and hire more regularly, we 
we would have a large, unlimited application for $600 a month. We launched three weeks ago, which is huge. It means that people can already access and use the higher flow system. And we've seen such strong uptake of our beta platform, which is really exciting and really shows how much there is a need for this free uh, integrated platform in the market. Our traction has been significant. We've seen 14 companies take up the system with two based in the United States, 22 jobs created, and 900 applications processed with some significant hirings resulting. So our ask is simple. Today, we're asking for $250,000 being spent on salaries, development, marketing, and sales. And we feel that with this money entrusted to us, we can really transform the hiring market. By December, we hope to finish these core integrations, and then having raised that 250000 by February, really transform the industry by reaching out to 500 companies using HireFlow. And our team is hugely well equipped to meet this demand. We have a broad range of experience from our own team, as well as from our advisors, Joel, Mike, and Ash, who we thank profusely for their help throughout this program. So to finish on tonight, we are not recruiters. We want to aid your existing hiring workflow, and we want to help you, if you're in a position where you're hiring, how to teach you and help you save $150,000 per year. Thank you. Thank you so much for a great presentation. It's lovely to see your enthusiasm. Thank you. Uh, I'm particularly impressed with how you've been able to form these partnerships with major employment platforms. That's fantastic and very significant. I think that's a huge achievement that you've been able to, to do throughout this program. Now, can you take me through the process? If I'm a hiring manager and I post a job yes. on Zik, yes. how do you screen that applicant? How, how do you screen? the job applications automatically, and how do you save your time? Just taking through the process. Absolutely. Quite clear. Thank you. Uh, great question, Petra. So, the way it works, say you're hiring for a developer, and you want to screen out the place that you know that they have the development skills that you require. The way it works for hire flows, you create the job, and post it to relevant job boards with your job description, say, C and a D. And anyone who applies to C and a D, those applicants are going to get pulled back into hire flows. Say I want to integrate HackerRank in order to automate the screening process, all I'd have to do then is click on HackerRank during the job creation process, and then all applicants who are pulled in from either C or D are automatically invited to a HackerRank test. Those who pass that test then get sent to a list on the applicant tracking system higher flow, where you can then review their resume and cover letter. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Petra. So, um, I agree. I think you've done an amazing job in such a short space of time. So Thank well you, Michelle. Um, I, I was interested in the um, process around using these third party services mm -hmm. and integrating them, mm -hmm. and whether you've had to seek approval for that, whether there's any intellectual property issues um, in that process, and then the partnerships you've got with. The likes of C, how deep are those partnerships? Is it just that you're using existing links, or are you really integrated into their partners? That's a really good question, Michelle. So, we, we pride ourselves in having partnerships that run deeper than just integrating their publicly facing APIs. So, a good example I'd like to state is Workful, a local, another local startup aiming to make job hiring more social. And we've personally spoken with them and have access to some of the more private uh, systems and services. And the flip side is that the reason why our partners are so excited to be working with us is because we're driving more traffic and enabling companies who wouldn't otherwise choose to say use Workable with HackerRank using HireFlow, they can now use both services, which for our partners is really exciting, which is why we've been able to build such strong relationships and continue to build such strong relationships with each other. Right. <clears throat> Thanks so much for that. Um, so, 22 jobs in three weeks. Awesome job. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, in terms of the money you're raising, <laughs> <laughs> um, what percentage is going to sales and marketing, and how are you going to use that to get propel you know, these companies to use your platform? Great question. I think that the, the hardest part when it comes to a startup is awareness. 
And that's why if we were to raise $250,000, a good three quarters of it would go towards sales and marketing. Because often the issue isn't simply that companies don't have the problem and are they're seeking solutions and aren't aware of the ones that already exist. And that's why we strongly believe that having a strong sales and marketing team, which this funding would go very much towards, would enable us to raise this awareness, particularly in the small to medium business space in which we're targeting. Just one last question for you, Nate. You went for the subscription model yes. over potentially a success fee model. Um, is there a reason for choosing that model? Have you tested the market? So, the business model, the small, medium, large model, is based off three things. First off, we want to be able to have this affiliate model with those of our partners. That way, even with the free package, we're still generating some level of revenue. The second part is the pricing itself, which is a bit of a black art, to be honest. But the reason why we picked those prices is because those prices conform to what the market is charging. Examples being our uh, 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 workable. And we feel that if we charge similar prices, our customers understand where these prices are coming from, but we're offering them so much more value than what the current entrants in the market currently charge. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, just quickly, I know there's not a lot of uh, reception, it's a bit like a bunker where we are. Um, so, if you're on Wi Fi um, and just go to use it, yes. This is our username and our password. Um, so, I'll just give you guys a second. Um, otherwise, we're really going to come on stage. Yeah, cool. Um, our next up is our first Ukrainian Australian team. Um, please welcome Carrillo from the Solo. My name is Kirillo and I am co-founder of Persolo. Persolo, one link to get paid. Easier, faster and smarter. Selling online and getting paid is always complicated. Creating and maintaining your website takes thousands of dollars. Besides, there is no elegant tool to sell on social networks. We already achieved 80 active sellers, and let me introduce the two of them, Tanya and Paul. Tanya is a jeweler. She designs and manufactures her own jewelry. Typically, she would redirect customers to her own website, where they need to go through different checks before making a payment. It always prevents to buy them emotionally. Besides, Tanya can't sell on social networks. Paul is a freelancer running his photo studio in CBD. Quite often, he can't build his clients for a logotype or a photograph. Besides, he hates when he needs to share his personal bank details with random people. Paul can't monetize his blog. Therefore, we came up to a solution. The idea of Persola was sparked by our wish to solve all payments complications. You just need to follow two easy steps. Step one, create a URL to a product that captures payment information. And then step two, share this URL cross platform Facebook, Twitter, SMS, doesn't matter. We entered a very competitive market. But at the same time, we offer a niche service that solves a specific problem in a simple way. We position ourselves in between classic payment solutions and store builders. We are not only providing customers to get paid, but offer them an elegant tool to get rich faster. And we hope this demo shows our competitive advantage. Well, Persola is easy. Just upload a photograph of any product, add title, description, no technical skills required. Add price and you are done. Persola is flexible. Share cross-platform on any device, Facebook, Twitter, SMS, doesn't matter. And Persola is smart. Imagine your buyers can buy emotionally just browsing your social media. 
At the moment, 60% of Persola transactions are coming from boutique stores. The size of the market is $76 million. At the same time, 30% of transactions are coming from freelance services. And the size of the market is $51 billion. However, keep in mind that it's our niche markets where we organically grew up. Total worldwide online transactions is 2.5 trillion. Do you see a potential? It's huge. We already achieved almost 100 active sellers and 3,000 in total transaction value. But we just started in September. Persola is a worldwide business. Only 30% of our performance is coming from Australia. And our revenue model is quite simple. We charge small transaction fee or subscription fee across several plans. Two months ago, we have a basic preview version and an idea. And now we have a fully working service, scalable customer base, and invigorating thoughts about the future. In November, we are going to start massive promotion. And by February 2016, we will achieve 10,000 active sellers and the first million in a cash flow. We could do it much more effective and efficient if we find funding today. We are Australian-Ukrainian team, as James mentioned. We are experts in analytics, design, marketing, and development. And we hope to empower global, globally social media sellers. And we couldn't achieve this without constant support of our advisory board. One more time, thank you, Margaret, Martin, Natasha, Hen, Kishan, and Paul for your invaluable support during the incubate project. Well, interesting slide, right? <laughs> we are looking to raise 250k for a 12 months runaway. 50% will go into marketing, 25% into product and design development, and another 25% in strategic partnership and sellers acquisition. And as I mentioned, Persolo is smart. If you would like to support us today with a small amount, just open this URL link. <laughs> For those who are playing big, just find me after the presentation and we will have a chat. Thank you very much. And before we jump into questions, let me introduce another co-founder, our beautiful co-founder of the team, Olga. Customer acquisition. Have you got that number worked out yet? So, you know, you spend 125000 on marketing. Um, how many customers are you going to require in that process? Understand. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, let's start with the backend. Uh, currently, we are using Stripe as a backend. Uh, we already established quite good relationship with them and received a 50k commission free period from Stripe because we met accidentally the SEO of the Stripe on some meeting. Yeah. Uh, regarding uh, cost of acquisition, currently all our clients are organically grown. So we found them organically. Uh, we already tried a few paid campaigns, and on average the cost of a seller's acquisition is about $10. But we're going to introduce two interesting marketing techniques to escalate this process. First of all, it will be a referral scheme, and second, at this, it will be paid 
uh, activities in social medias. So uh, I know that the important group to market is our strategic partnerships. Um, just wondering how you guys found that. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. Uh, Thank you for, for a question. Yes, so actually we are in contact with a couple of retailer groups. Yeah, that's something closing. So actually we have a good niche there because we actually satisfy some of their needs. Uh, but uh, in one plan, we plan actually to get in a partnership with uh, big social media players, right? So this makes perfect sense with our service. And uh, we were in contact actually, but we're still in the process of negotiation yet yeah, in the first uh, stages. Yeah, with Instagram here in, in Australia. So uh, because the service is fantastically uh, suitable for Instagram, yes, yeah, some of our sellers actually have Instagram accounts. Yeah, they try to sell, yeah, but there is no actual way to buy, yeah, for the buyers, products on Instagram. And uh, as, as you have seen here, yes, yeah, so we offer a link to a product, one product, right, and one photo of a product. So Instagram is what people do, right? So they post, or they photo of themselves, or photo of one product. So I believe it's an excellent solution, so we'll develop this, hopefully, yeah, this partnership will happen, yeah, and we'll somehow attract even more potential there. Yeah, so thank you so much. Question just sort of in Scotland, but I'm feeling very invigorated about your future. And I wanted to ask you about um, partnerships in terms of adding credibility to this because, of course, there's always a concern when you shop online, uh, and it's a platform that you haven't seen before, and it's a strike is back end, etc. But have you thought about that in terms of strategic partnerships and also have you looked at where your sweet spot is in terms of the transactions? Because presumably it would be smaller transactions up to a certain amount. Can you elaborate on that a little bit for me? Uh, what type of transactions and the size of those transactions? Uh, <clears throat> let's start uh, with the following. We are not experts in law. Uh, that's why we found a good uh, lawyer that helped us a lot. Uh, and like, you know, if there will be a process of negotiating with different partnerships, yeah. we better rely on his knowledge and expertise rather than our own. Uh, regarding cost of transactions and like what we propose to our sellers, basically there are three plans. One plan, there is no subscription fee, so it will be fee per transaction, right? Uh, another plan is purely subscription fee. Currently, because sixty percent of our sales are coming from boutique stores, the average. Uh, cost of transaction is about $90, which is quite high. That's why, you know, we are thinking about different ways how we can uh, negotiate, like, w w what kind of things we can provide to our sellers. And we, we have huge plans, believe me. Yeah. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, just another shout out if you want to use the hashtag to pick you up, we're probably going to be my phone is going off. And also, this is the username and password if you want to access our wireless accounts. Okay, on to our first start. Can we please invite Joe from Panabox? Please welcome Joe. Thank you. My name's Joe, and I'm the founder of Panabox. Now, to start, I'd like to talk to you guys a bit about anger. I mean, anger normally is a force for bad, but I believe in the right circumstance, anger can be a force for good. Something that I'm angry about in particular is the fact that each year around $8 billion worth of perfectly edible food gets chucked out in Australia. I'm also angry about the fact that restaurants in Australia have no other option when they make too much food and they don't have enough time to sell it. They have no other option but to chuck it in the bin. And this ends up in landfill. And this isn't good because 
this stuff decomposes. And when it decomposes, it releases huge amounts of methane. And this methane, I mean, this methane is not very good either. Methane is a very noxious greenhouse gas. It's 25 times more dangerous uh, than carbon dioxide for our atmosphere. So this isn't a people problem. This isn't a food problem. This is simply a logistics problem. The food system is broken, so how are we going to fix it? With a mobile app that sells perishable food to last minute consumers at a discount. This is Tuckerbox. This is the way we're going to reframe food wastage as not just a problem but an opportunity. As a customer, when you open the app, you simply scroll through the items that are geolocated. They're the only, they're only, it's only going to show you items that are close by and you simply tap twice to purchase. Now this is something worth noting because this, in the mobile ordering industry, this is actually unheard of. You could use Tuckerbox to buy a meal for a couple of dollars and you would normally pay eight or ten dollars from a restaurant that you go to all the time. You could use it for uh, a, a late night work dinner to share with colleagues that you don't want to break the bank with. You, a bunch of driven students could use this to, to stock up on cheap food and put it in the freezer and then take it out one day at a time and really go on the cheap. As a restaurant, it's really easy to use. All you have to do is you take a picture of the item that you want to sell, you name your price and you set a time limit and off you go. So obviously we think Tucker Box is pretty good, but what does everyone else think? So far we have 2,000 customers on the waiting list ready to use the product. We have 70 participating restaurants and we have a passionate community that emails me every couple of days wanting to know the latest developments. So how big is this opportunity? Let's, let's consider that an average restaurant or cafe throws out around, and let's say for example sandwiches, the same garden, five sandwiches a day. And let's say that these sandwiches are worth $8 each. Let's consider the fact that in Australia we have 50,000 restaurants and cafes. That will lead us to have a market cap, uh, total addressable market of around $730 million. If we go a little bit further afield and we have a look at the US market, it gets a little bit more considerable. At the moment, we have a fully working prototype, um, and in December, we're going to launch, uh, uh, launch this prototype to our registered users. By June 2016, we are projected to have 500 uh, restaurants uh, using the app and 200,000 customers. My name is Joe Greathead. I'm an award-winning advertising creative. My why not? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, our, our development lead is Mike Pierce. Uh, he's got 14 years of experience uh, as a full stack programmer. Uh, and our strategy and operations lead is Hugh Simpson. He's an MBA from the greatest union in the world. You see it. Um, and, and at EY. We've also got a cracking team of advisors. Uh, Chris Gabriel, uh, CEO of a, a chairman of Alive Mobile, Matt Burns, CEO of Curicon, and Ray Pratiba, VP of Product, Shoebox Australia. Food wastage or food loss is a huge financial and ecological problem, but it's also a huge opportunity. As we grow to a global audience, a global uh, population of nine billion people—that's crazy, right? But that's going to happen, apparently. We're going to be facing a whole raft of unique problems, and these problems are starting to represent the key growth industries of our time. Products and services in elder care, renewable energy, and water management are growing exponentially. And food loss, and by extension food security, is no less as important and significant as any of these issues. 
Now, today, I want to. I, I want anyone in this room that knows anyone that works or owns a restaurant or a cafe or even better, a chain of restaurants or cafes um, or anyone that experiences this problem, I want to meet those people um, and I'm not, I'm not shy of asking for that. Um, if you want to support us right now, please go to the website here, just up on the slide. Uh, you can register your email and we'll send you a link when we're launching to the, to the general public. Um, and also, if you're as passionate about food waste as, as I am, um, please come and talk to me at the Tuck Box booth after the presentation. Love to chat. Thanks for listening. Um, look, very important problem uh, that you've got to solve, and uh, I want you to have for it. Um, Thomas has started to have these pop-up restaurants I see for food waste, have you spoken to them at all? Yeah, yeah, so uh, one of the mentors here, uh, uh, Hank Kingman, is a board member, and uh, we've uh, had a dialogue about uh, the sort of interrelation of the two organisations. Excellent. So, I don't see it as competitive, but I can see some very clear synergies between yeah, well, com completely different business models, obviously, um, but um, we're both trying to solve a similar problem. Um, Speaking about business model, are you a non profit? How are you going to show this interesting business? How do you make money? No, we're, we're, we're a for profit company, and um, I'm, I'm very unflinching about that. I don't really see that it, it being a problem, uh, being a social entrepreneur and uh, having it mutually exclusive, the being, want, wanting to go after profit as opposed to uh, wanting to do a social good, I don't see them as being having to be mutually exclusive. So how are you going to make money? We're going to make money by taking a 12, I completely missed that, we're going to make money by taking a 12% clip of every transaction that goes through the app. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, good question to you. Obviously, like um, the fact that maybe doing a great good as part of your mission. Just wondering if you took somebody like a vendor or one of the other bigger players signed up a lot of the market. Um, would it be hard for them to implement a type of box solution? Yes, it would actually. And this is this is actually a software thing. Um, so the way that the way the type box is built, uh, it's we we I mean this, is, this might sound a little bit confusing, but each item is individually is an individual set of data. So and and each item is is entered individually into the system. The way that menu log and delivery hero work is they uh, take on the entire menu of, of, that, of, of whatever organization it is at the beginning uh, and then they're completely hands off for the, for the rest of their working arrangement. So it's complete, for them to implement something like this, it would be a complete overhaul of their entire software uh, uh, from, from, from top to bottom. So I, I mean there is a, there, they could do it, but it's a significant barrier, and um, yeah. Yes, it's sort of like the last Yeah, so another way of looking at it is hotels tonight for food, if anyone's aware of hotels tonight. Yeah. So, so do we have your own stuff at Would you have a brand? I don't have enough money to even consider, you know, <laughs> engaging that person, but. It's not me. I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask you to talk about the next one. Thank you. Um, I really like how you're repositioning uh, food app for your social good. I think it gives you a bit more of a point of difference in the market. Um, in terms of the two sided market problem, mm. in terms of um, the restaurant customers, how are you going about signing those up and then how are you going to replicate that? Is it, have you just been doing around Sydney or, or you know, what, what's So right now it's going to, uh, it, it operates uh, very effectively just with a person with a person to person sales process. Um, we have a kit rate of around about 70%. Um, it's just, it's just kind of a no brainer really. Um, and the way that we can set up the program is that they can engage with it as little or as much as they like. They can set up, restaurants generally put their food on special uh, at the same time every day. So we can key that in 
uh, and we can have that ready to go and, and, and it pops up on the consumer's phone uh, whenever it's whenever these items are available. So it's that it's it's things like this that, that we're sort of implementing into the software to make it really easy for them to sort of engage and continue to use it. Does that answer your question? No. Sorry. Yeah, I was actually interested in the consumers. Actually. Oh, right, yeah, okay. Yeah, because I knew how you Okay, re, re me. <laughs> Sorry, um, so how do you get consumers on? Okay, um, at the moment we're building community on Facebook. Um, I'm building with, so the, the 2,000 customers that we have built up, we've built up, uh, to begin with, I've built up just from person-to-person -person sales. Um, but we're building up an email database and we're going to be, and we're using referral uh, campaigns to, uh, leverage that uh, initial user base and to grow it from there. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah. All right, we're now halfway through. Can I please invite Alina Spide by no means smallest team to an education on stage? Please welcome Fluid. Thank you. 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 When I was in year 11, my school built a custom diary app that theoretically allowed us to look at our time for the week, upcoming classes, upcoming events in the college calendar, and do some basic homework tracking. Emphasis on the word theoretically, because in reality, it was terrible. It didn't do much. The things it did do, it did poorly, and sometimes it just didn't work at all. So my co-founder and I, like all good programmers do, built our own app. It was native, it was nimble, it was sleek, and it worked. The student body loved it, and the school principal was so impressed with our work that he wanted to license the software from us on a yearly basis. Mind you, we were only 16 and 17 at the time. Ultimately, the success of this app was in that it was built for students by students. And that's the current problem that lies at the heart of educational technology. Right now, if you're a school, you could go out and buy any number of apps or services that, that say that, um, that say that however, these apps are being built for school administrators. As a student, all is what is coming out next. But to do this, she has to take a photo of her paper timetable and make it a wallpaper on her phone. She doesn't want to deal with the hassle of downloading an app and manually inputting every single class and managing it when things never really change. As a teacher and new group coordinator, John is constantly inundated with paperwork and calls from distressed parents. He doesn't want to be doing tedious admin work. He wants to be focusing on teaching maths. And as a parent, Jo wants her children to succeed at school, but she cannot track their progress all year round. Instead, the line on semester reports that come only twice a year. When she asks her children how they're going to school, of course they're going to inflate the marks and not get the entire details. That's where our app comes in. Backpack is a web and mobile app that collects learning management, resources, homework management, reporting, communication, and more into a single unified experience. Backpack is highly specialized and targets the specific problems that exist in each of these custom segments. For students just like Maria, they can see their class timetable, due dates for upcoming work, and more from the convenience of a mobile app within wherever they are. For teachers like John, they can manage paperwork electronically and automatically push out updates to parents. And for parents like Joe, they can keep up to date with their child's progress all throughout the school year, not just twice when the reports come out. Currently, we have two customers. My alma mater, St. Aloysius College, and St. Ignatius College Review. At St. Aloysius College, Backpack is being used on a regular basis by 62.5% of people, 
which is over 35% more than the educational technology that it replaced. And this number is on an iPad alone and will only continue to grow with the interaction of iPhone and Android apps later this year. As mentioned, we already have a few customers and we're in discussions with eight more schools by the end of 2015, including Xavier College, Riverside Girls High School, and the King School. Our business model is very simple, $10 per student enrolled per year. For the schools that are undecided, we offer a free 30-day no obligation trial. This product requires no integration on our end or the school's end, so they are free to just plug and play. In Australia, there are 9,000 schools, and it represents a market uh, it represents a market potential of $70 billion. With even just a 5% penetration of 400 to 500 schools, we can generate $5 million in annual revenue. And the EduTech market globally has been growing 9% uh, over the past five years and now currently sits over 200 billion US dollars, which is massive. By December, we'll be finishing our parent and teacher apps as well as our free product trial. As mentioned, we're in discussion with eight schools to have 10 by the end of 2015, and by the end of 2016, we'll have a minimum of 30 schools on board. And these 30 schools are going to generate for us between 200 to $250,000 in revenue for the year starting in 2017. Fluid Education is a two person team. My co founder, Declan Scott, manages our technical direction and leads development on Android and the web. I manage our business development, as well as our product strategy, sales, and marketing. We're also lucky enough to have looking after us through every step of the start. Should I just talk about it? Yeah. Okay, so there's only one more slide to ask. So tonight, all we're asking for are introductions to schools, educate companies, and anyone else in the educate space. Please see us at the booths, or you can email myself. Or you can email Giro, which is G-I-O-R-G-I-O, at fluideducation.com.au. Thank you. The interface with the school's administration systems, if you're going to report on things like assessments and what's going on, so do you actually have to do an integration? Yes, so at the moment we currently at Allergies integrate with um, their learning management systems, their student information systems, so that's Canvas and that's um, Synergetic. We also have a number of other systems. We do this through easy access and very easy to integrate. And we've built the product so that we have a We also have um, a middleman between the school and the interface so that we can do um, updates to the systems that we integrate with on the fly and then deliver it again. Just a really quick point on your marketing strategy. You could have been combining with the Catholic schools. <laughs> Go straight to the Catholic education system <laughs> and you could do deals at that level. Instead of doing deal by deal with schools. So, to get to increase your uptake faster of this sort of thing, yeah. I think that'd be really worthwhile. Yes, yeah, so we have been looking at um, so, uh, people like the Arch uh, Bishop of the Diocese of Paramount who um, looks after like 40 schools, for example, and you um, get someone who can get 40 schools. They will use the same learning management system. As a parent, I love this. This is a new trend. I really love what you're doing. I work with quite a few IT companies. They couldn't be more, they agree more with what Michelle just said. It's so hard to sell the schools. It's such a flaw. So, yes, start with the Catholic schools, but there are also schools that are grouped 
uh, like big picture education that says the ways to go about that, and I would advise that you talk to as many other ATF companies that are doing this uh, as we possibly can to get their ideas about it as well. But yeah, fantastic product, and really look forward to it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I concur with uh, these guys here. There's also um, Catholic school conferences that you can pitch at, and exhibitions and stuff like that, and, and similar for other verticals. Um, have you thought about school scooping the ticket as a um, fundraising exercise? Sorry, what was that? Um, so the money that, so I think students pay for the uh, yes, yes. schools pay for the. Yes, so at the moment the schools have them, oh, um, but okay. we're working on a free product. Right, um, okay. And that will be in that user. Um, but any payment, for example, any payments to go through, such as sure. payments for excursions, payments for things like uh, drama, plays, things like that, we can just hold it off that. Right, okay, yeah. that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to send out this. Uh, please welcome Jay from Uprise. Hi. I wish I was doing a API integration to get PowerPoint working at conferences. Plug in my camera. How's that? I'm Jay Spence, I'm the founder of Uprise, and we are a workplace productivity and phone coaching service. I've completed a PhD in six years of research on how to deliver psychological skills online. The research won three awards because we made it really simple for people to access research-based psychological treatments from a smartphone. Stress and productivity are linked. But for most companies, the stress management of their employees is an afterthought. They have employee counselling services, but typically these react when an employee is in a crisis and there's nothing really preventative. So if you have an employee who's really struggling, then typically they're going to call a company counselling hotline. I mean, it isn't really a hotline because they'll be told that they'll get an appointment next week. Then they have to get to the appointment. Therapy takes a lot of time. A lot of, the, a lot of these employees actually won't go through with it at all because of their confidentiality concerns. And their chance of being a good therapist is pretty low because the services pay far below the industry average. But the thing that really stops employees from getting help is that they downplay how stressed they are and they just keep working. So most, pro most employees will deny they have a problem until they've got a problem on every level. Then they're in the GP's office and the GP's telling them that they're going to need to take a month off work. So why is this happening? It's happening because there's so many barriers to getting support that it will block for about 90% of employees from even trying. So, Uprise is a preventative mental health solution. And it's preventative in the sense that it's working on reducing stress and the other factors that create burnout in employees. The way we do this is we deliver psychological skills as videos and we back that up with a phone coaching service. There's 10 years of internationally collaborated data showing that this combination of on-demand skills plus phone coaching will outperform any standalone app and it will match the results of the best face-to-face -face therapies for common stress conditions. Under the hood, what Uprise is doing is it treats all of the factors that lead to burnout, like depression, anxiety, and stress. But in order to make it attractive to employees, what we do is we talk about performance. So we don't want to create barriers by making Uprise all about problems, and instead we really make it clear to the employees that what we're doing is we're helping them to perform better in the workplace and to do it without stress. So how does it work? First, employees log on, log on and they complete a quick test to measure their productivity levels. 
Then they watch a short video that's based on, on proven skills to reduce stress and deal with this, the factors that lead to burnout. They choose a time for a, one of our psychologists to give them a call and they get a coaching call to tailor the skills in the course to their individual situation so it makes sense to them. And here are some of the results from our last trial. It was run over three weeks in an uncontrolled format. We found that over the three week period, the number of unproductive hours in the day was halved and the time that they were taking off work was also halved. And we got a whole bunch of testimonials like these ones. In fact, one out of six participants in the trial ended up referring a friend or a family member without us even asking. Uprise costs the same as a one-day training and less than it would cost that employee to go into the counselling service. And we have data that shows that the results will last for six to 12 months. The size of the Australian workforce is 11.8 million and that represents a local market of $5.9 billion. Our first paying customer is Lendlease, and we're really excited to get started with them next month. Plus, we have three other companies who are interested in doing a pilot trial with us to talk about a feasibility for a wider rollout. We also have a large multinational software company who's really interested in with capacity to scale us globally if we get onto a winning formula. We've got a growing team of designers, developers, psychologists, and advisors but we really need your help as well. Before you go, I'd be really appreciative if you could write an email to your HR director or your HR manager and CC me in. Let them know that you see a product that would probably work in your, in your workspace. And I would really hope that there's an opportunity here for you to help somebody. If you think about your office, or even if you think about your own stress levels, there's probably someone around who's really under pressure at the moment. And in three weeks, I'd be hoping that we can get the same type of testimonials that you saw before. That's really the type of change that we're trying to bring into every workplace. So thanks for your help with it, and thanks for listening. I lost a bet. <laughs> so I was, um, was working in a research clinic and I had a colleague who was very poppy, who was doing these net treatments at the time. He told me he treated 10 times the number of patients that I could treat in a month. I took him on. He was using these net treatments. He wiped the floor with me. And it was pretty easy to see all of the, the leverage that you can get out of technology to treat people faster. So I think most psychologists get into a treatment because they want to be able to help as many people as possible. And it was really clear what you could do with, at then, what was a really clunky treatment program, and still we're getting 40 people that are better per month. So that's what it, what's all started. Um, and if you take somebody like Orlando Lace with 7,500 staff, would they only be referring in people that they sort of deemed to be at risk, or is it something they would open up to allowing the staff access to? And so what do you think the value of that customer could be to your organisation? Yeah, I think there are 15,000 employees within Lendlease, and the way that we're going about it is in stages. So we've got a small team at the moment. We only have capacity to manage a certain amount. We want to do that really well, and we want to make sure that we can give a confidential and safe service and be managing every single person in there that goes well. But Lendlease is really interested in expanding at each level, and we've got a plan to go through different sectors of the company, as long as everything is going to be hitting all of the right treatment outcomes for them. I love what you do every day. Thank I think you. it's amazing. I see a lot of people with different health apps making various claims, but you have evidence. It's research based, and that's what I really like about it. Now, I'm just going to follow on Michelle's question a little bit about scalability, because obviously, with phone coaching, etc., you need to have a psychologist, is that right? Yeah. To, to do that. How are you, how are you going to scale this? So, like Lindley, for example, with all these thousands of employees, and this gets taken up. How, how are you going to manage growth? How yeah. scale so currently, it's a scalable business in the sense that one therapist can treat 90 people over a month. So that's good leveraging it in as much as that ratio is. But the next level is, is that there's been a number of studies being conducted over the last five years where what they did was they took a specialist clinician and they compared that to a layperson with no training. So they did the coaching 
and they got the same results. So you really don't need a psychologist. I'm using a psychologist for psychologists because that's what I like working with and I'm used to working with. But eventually this would mean that you can scale them out, it means you reduce the cost down. And we're also working with some other people in our incubator team who've got a background in machine learning to be able to develop a program where we can do an entirely self-guided version and replace artificial intelligence with the therapist. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you. And I've just got a question about the product too. So um, basically you don't need to do any personalization for any company that you work with. So these types of problems are the same because we're humans, not because we're facing a different set of you know stresses in every workplace. Or you know, is there some sort of personalization on the um, therapist side? You know, that's the that's the interesting thing about stress is it's pretty universal. Stress in America is the same as in Britain. Um, the way that it works really is in psychology, it's called a transdiagnostic process. So it's, it's like, what are the factors that you can treat to make sure that people improve? So we've developed a, like a universal protocol to treat all of the common conditions together. And we've got evidence to say that that will be able to deal with the majority of issues in the workplace. And we have protocols set up so that we can filter out those people who aren't going to benefit from our service, and we refer them into the employee assistance providers or community psychologists. Thanks very much, Jay. <laughs> All right, you might have noticed that in that um, uh, response to one of the questions Jay said he's getting help from on the incubator startups, actually one of the best things about our program is now that we've got 48 startups, we actually have a crazy amount of wealth in some areas, um, one of which now is machine learning and AI. Um, and our next startup is coming on stage as well. Their team is extremely skilled that has been helping our startups on a ridiculous level. We actually had to ask them, one of our guys to take their members off their team slide um, just because it was confusing the matter. But um, please, uh, without further ado, let me welcome Joe from First Step. Hi, I'm Joe from First Step, and we're here to make investing effortless. Let me start by telling you a story about a man who died in his 90s with less than $10,000 to his name. The same man returned to work aged 85 just to find himself. He didn't drink, gamble, or live lavishly. In fact, he worked as a surgeon across Europe and Southeast Asia. How do I know this man? Well, he's my grandfather, and, and yes, I have my grandmother's permission to share this. He told me repeatedly not to make his mistake. He encouraged me to learn and start investing early. But then I realized that the vast majority of young Australians are in the same boat as me. 87% of us don't invest, which is why we started investing. Young Australians don't trust investing. Share market participation has fallen dramatically. Australians are expected to outlive their savings down to 10 years. Why? Because of high minimum investment, high management fees, and lack of know-how, we are not investing in our financial future. So what is our solution? A mobile app that lets you automatically invest the loose change of your electronic transactions. Say you buy a coffee, but you get to your bank card, round it up to the next whole dollar, that 50 cents is your loose change investment. Remember the old adage, look after the pennies and the pounds to take care of themselves? With no minimum investment, sign up that requires just your phone and likely five minutes of your time, you can be investing in the spare change of your electronic transactions in a portfolio diversified across over 7,000 assets with the risk profile of your choosing. We surveyed and found that 87% of young Australians don't directly invest, yet 75% of them are happy to invest in an app like ours. Our target market? is 2.7 million young Australians. They could be investing $1 billion of loose change a year. Young professionals, tertiary students, or even a parent wanting to open an investment account to teach their 12 year old child. We have the lowest minimum investment in the whole world. At first step, you can start investing with just one cent, and our fees are lower than the rest. Here's how we're different. 
We've built our own bank APIs in-house. They are free for us to use. Others have had to partner up or pay to do this. We don't pay a clearance fee on share transactions. We built a robot trader that requires zero queuing uh, intervention. We're Australian, uh, and we know the local, local market, unlike the foreign apps. If the user invests $80 of blue change and, uh, and deposits a month with 100,000 users, that's $96 million of assets under management in one year. We charge a 1% fee. Our revenue increases cumulatively. As our users continue to spend, their loose change enters their investment accounts. We expect to double our revenue the following year. Our team has significant experience in finance and technology. Tarang started investing when he was just 13 years old, when his grandfather bought him a share certificate. He and Aksha are the experienced developers with two successful startup exits. Banerja, she's a CFA, advising super funds. Shiraj is a CPA, and I've done a diploma in financial planning. In just six months, we've built the same bank technology as Pocketbook. We have an administrative app which accepts incoming loose change and a robot trader which purchases securities. All of this is encompassed with bank grade security and encryption. Our software allows for fractional share ownership. Because of this, no investment amount is too small and faster. There is no other company in Australia that offers fractional share ownership. In just the last eight weeks, over a thousand Australians have joined the wages to start using Percent when we launch. Tonight, we hope to raise $950,000 for an 18 month runway. We will launch on the App Store in Q1 of 2016. The $950,000 will be spent on NFSL licensing, custom acquisition, and security. Our goal in the next 18 months is to have 100,000 users on Percent. Thank you. I'd like to invite my co-founder Shirad and Tarang on stage. Can we go forward? Who is your target market for this? Who do you think um, is going to use this step? Um, so our target market is 18 to 34 year olds, millennials essentially. Uh, we're targeting three segments. So the first is university students, um, so young people looking to invest very small amounts of those change that happens unconsciously. Um, then we want to target young professionals who've just started learning and want to perhaps contribute a bit more in terms of top-ups or one-time deposits. And finally, a very interesting thing happened where we had a parent call in saying they'd like to start the investment portfolio for their eight-year-old girl. Um, <laughs> perhaps they can start something when they're eight and uh, get those funds when they're 18. So that's the value of time and compounding and contributing small amounts over the long term to grow the investment. I'm interested in um, RoboTrader. What's Not the, have you got a track record with this? And, you know, how are you evaluating, you know, so I'm an investor, I'm gonna, you know, I need to take my loose change. How do, you, how do I know that you're going to deliver me maybe, you know, at least on market or above market performance? Are you using an exchange trade platform? Our strategy is to invest in index funds. So we believe that you can't actually outperform the market in the long run. We basically try to match the market and over time we beat everyone else because that's what everyone else tries to beat. But statistically, no one manages to do it over the long run. Uh, our robo trader is quite simple, it just buys this on very simple base rules. Uh, our regulation is quite strong, we won't be, it won't, it would be quite hard to mess that up. Um, talk to me about, you, you ask me for quite a big chunk of money for a and obviously yes, you are going to need the exercises, etc. What do you do if you don't get $950,000 for six months? What's going to happen first step? Uh, so I guess um, we're a financial service startup operating in an existing regulatory environment. So we do still have to comply with existing laws until 
I guess ASIC, you know, changes these laws to suit fintech start startups, for example. Um, for us to um, launch, we need some existing um, investment vehicles because we're offering a retail fund for young people, etc. So there, there are certain amounts that we need in terms of launching. Uh, so essentially, uh, so uh, that's about 150k setup costs in terms of ASSL licensing, as well as a managed investment scheme, which is a, uh, essentially an investment vehicle. And then beyond that, we incur annual funds management costs, such as auditing and accounting costs. Um, we also have to spend in terms of um, KYC costs, so to overcome the ML and knowing our customer and so on. So um, that's a fee that we incur on a per user basis. But then the other costs are user acquisition because we want to go to about 100,000 users. Uh, there are user acquisition costs. So we can potentially save this out over the 18 month period. Yeah, I would recommend that you do that. Absolutely. All the existing companies that we have in our portfolio at the moment have had to do that. It's made it so much easier. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, two more startups, and then we'll hit the drinks, uh, and then the prize, and then we'll hit the drinks. But please uh, let me invite Masood from Abyss. Please come, please welcome to suit. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Masood Namshbandi and I'm the co-founder of Abyss Solutions, an autonomous inspection and analytics company. Did you know that in Australia alone there's more than 60,000 kilometers of waterways? All of these waterways have structures such as walls, banks, piers, jetties, all of which needs to be inspected regularly in order to uh, maintain them, which allows us to have safe clean drinking water, uh, safe, safe and safer bridges, and protect us from floods and other natural disasters. Now, how do all of this uh, critical infrastructure get inspected at the moment? Well, you'll be surprised, because it all gets done manually by these guys. And of course, this is very costly, it's unsafe, and you cannot cover all the areas because of the way it's done. Obviously, the person who's diving into the water cannot cover the entire 60,000 kilometers. So what is our solution? In fact, Alexandra Canal in Sydney could not be inspected by anybody in the country. <coughs> Excuse me. Because for those reasons, two main reasons were in particular, because the water was toxic, so even if you wanted to use a diver, you couldn't use it. And secondly, lack of access. It had industrial estates and warehouses on both sides of the bank. We solve all these issues. How? By creating an autonomous inspections platform. We take autonomous aquatic drones and we put them in the waterways to collect high resolution imagery from both above and below water, which is then fed into our software where we create satellite, uh, satellite style 3D uh, maps with geotag references for all the faulty areas which the engineer can go through. This includes an engineer's review with on the tag a 3D map of the structure and other useful information. How big is the market? How big, what's the opportunity out there? Well, in New South Wales alone, the market is at $123 million. And that's based on the fact that there are more than 12,000 kilometers of waterways. In Australia, the market is $615 million. And the US UK market we estimate to be worth more than $1.5 billion. Now, of course, the technology we're developing is not just restricted to waterways. In fact, waterways is just one uh, piece of the pie. The technology we're developing has many more applications than other fields. For example, aquaculture monitoring, dam and reservoirs inspection, and ship hull inspection. The reason we chose waterways as our entry point was due to ease of market penetration. We actually have a customer waiting to trial our product. The team is consisted of four founders. There's me, I have uh, academic and industry experience in sensor technology and data acquisition. Nasser has a PhD in over 10 years experience in data uh, analytics, machine learning, and robotics. 
Abraham is a qualified structural engineer and a second time founder, and Hina looks after the finances and accounting. And we also want to thank the advisors that we had on board and all the mentorship that we had throughout the whole incubator period, but in particular Mark Pesci and uh, Mike Nichols. So what makes us different? Well, our team is unique. We have over 20 plus years experience, expert experience at my end, of combined robotics, data analytics, sensors, and engineering. This unique blend of expertise and experience allows us to turn everything that's done manually at the moment and automate it. And this allows us to give you a complete end-to-end -end inspection package. What's our business model? Well, we charge $10,000 per kilometer of waterway that we inspect fully. So that's site inspection, reporting, mapping, the whole lot. That's at least two thirds cheaper than currently current industry standards. In the future, we will actually move on to other revenue streams and we'll create these other revenue streams. For example, cloud services to host this data and update them with regular features. We will also create auto automated 3D mapping software and predictive maintenance reporting, all using machine learning approaches. And all these different uh, revenue streams will be as a subscription-based model, which we'll, we'll license off. So far, we're engaged with Sydney Water to trial our product at Alexandra Canal, and upon the completion of this trial, they will actually roll this out to the entire network of 450 kilometers of waterways. We also engage with the University of Sydney to look at their large rain and stormwater tanks. And we already had two paid clients for water systems inspection and optimization. We will be raising in six months time a seed front uh, after we have finished our trial with Sydney Water. So if you're interested, please let us know and we'll keep you updated with our progress. And we're also looking for introductions for more clients. So if you know anybody in the uh, uh, water utilities industry, uh, please let us know, we would love to meet them. Thank you very much. around the product mm -hmm. and your service um, and so how you can make that unique. Uh, so at, at, at the moment we're using off-the-shelf product and combining them in a unique way. But uh, as we develop our product further and further, we'll actually use machine-based machine learning approaches to automate the whole system. So in terms of that, so the IP is as you question like how where we are creating the IP. So the IP is basically in our team as well. So as I said, we have 20 years plus experience in machine learning. Like you cannot go and get a team like us on the street or anywhere else. That's a highly qualified team. So that's the IP that we have in our company. That's the most valued asset. And using that, we can create different kinds of IP. So for example, we will use the machine learning approach for predictive failure prediction. So that's a big market that we'll, uh, that's no one else is doing at the moment, which we want to move into. So you say that it's not through the hardware or the software? Sorry? Would you say that it's not the IPs, it's not yeah. with the hardware or with the software? Uh, the it would be, software yeah, yeah. And it would be kind of both because uh, we want to integrate the software side with the hardware because the hardware by itself uh, is very manual at the moment or semi-autonomous, even you may call it the most advanced one. So the prediction of the the software will be used for the to control the robot, and so you can put waypoints. So you can just put it in the water and collect it at the end uh, at, the, at the end of the canal. So the software is for the hardware itself, but we also create other softwares like the uh, web hosting, uh, the, sorry, the data hosting, and other predictive uh, maintenance reporting software. So it's both ways. A great picture of the clear. Thank you. Um, the five money you pay, what are you hoping that will, um, like, where will that get you to? Mm. So, the money we uh, will uh, looking to raise, uh, that will be to hire engineers to uh, really accelerate our development process because this is a very technical challenge and we need to get like, the best people on board to do this, uh, to help us accelerate this. Uh, we can do it organically with our current team, but that's going to take a long time. So with the money, the most of it would be actually spent on uh, hiring more engineers and software people. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thanks very much. And now to my our last start up on the stage for tonight. Uh, please welcome Alex from Forever Network. Alex. Hi, I'm Alex Sunsky, co-founder and CEO of Forever Network, and we are the future of social news. So what is it exactly that's taken me from developing sports content as a 16-year-old to building a brand that generates 69 million social monthly impressions? Well, countless research studies have shown time and time again our millennial generation do not go searching for news and lifestyle content. Our generation will not be rushed home for the 6 p.m. bulletin. Rather, we will read the headlines on the way home and watch the video highlights later on in the evening. Why? We want the convenience of having content in the palm of our hands when and where we want it. And we want the quality that comes from having our social networks filter that content for us. There remains only one news lifestyle topic where social is not the major source, and that's sports. Why is it that sports, one of the few topics that can garner such passion, the one topic that is inherently social and shareable, is still not predominantly consumed on social sources? This is the question we set out to address when we started Forever Network. Being young, teenage sport fans ourselves, we wanted to start by creating content we liked and launched our first sports vertical through social media, Basketball Forever. We wanted to create the best visual experience for our audience. We wanted everything from captivating video content of key moments that could be watched again and again. We wanted rapid response merchandise for breaking news and viral plays. We wanted graphic models for team rivalries leading up to playoffs. We made sure news of a great play didn't just travel from one end of the globe to the other. We made sure it began trends on Twitter, viral videos on YouTube, incredibly popular posts on Facebook, turning any ordinary news update into an online sensation within minutes. Not only is this style of content able to easily communicate the passion and energy sports creates, it's also perfectly optimized for social media and easily monetized through creative advertising, relevant endorsements, uh, uh, product and merchandise sales, and content subscriptions. Basketball Forever has all of our articles, breaking news, uh, editorials, graphics, and engaging video, and post rises, the outlet we created for all of our high end downloadable content, has things such as our wallpapers and our digital magazine. During the program, we were able to successfully launch the first issue of our digital magazine, featuring uh, an exclusive interview with our cover athlete, Harrison Barnes. In the first month, we had 45,000 readers, over 7,000 digital downloads, and an average user read time of 33 minutes. So what sets us apart is the way we are able to parallel the cultural tone and passion of our target audience to genuinely connect the engage on a level unattainable by others. We combine this with our unique visual style so that we're creating content that's different and making sure it's delivered differently. We've had some of our content featured in very reputable um, sports outlets, such as Sports Illustrated, ESPN, and even the NBA. We're even lucky enough to have our own original design up in Mark Cuban's office. For those of you up the back who don't have binoculars, uh, that's the design. During the program, it only made sense for us to develop a platform that allowed our fans to experience all this in one place. Our Basketball Forever web and mobile platform will allow users to enjoy all of our social content as well as native content on the site, streaming into a beautiful feed of rich social sporting news. They'll be able to create their own profile, share, save, and interact with content they like, as well as upload their own thoughts, opinions, and content of their own in order to increase their influence score. Um, in order. Yeah, in order to increase their influence score. 
So what we're doing is we're, uh, we're actually combining our winning strategy of social content delivery with user-generated content uh, in, in order to, uh, in order, I'm losing my train of thought, in order to, I'm just so caught up with how like, this works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, no uh, we do this uh, in order to give a voice to just the average sport fan. And we're not just planning on doing this for basketball. We want to build a vertical for as many different sports as possible. There is huge, unbelievable potential in countless different uh, sports markets uh, just waiting, waiting to experience, uh, enjoy an equivalent experience to their favorite sport. None of this, of course, would be possible without our incredible team. Jaden Harris, our co-founder and, and head of operations, Ishad Mistra, uh, our creative director and technical developer, Tyson Beck, our chief content officer, Aaron Smith, our NBA correspondent, and Landon Marino, our lead digital journalist. We're also very grateful to have our, um, our, our team of advisors that we connected through, uh, connected to through the event. What we are looking for are writers, graphic designers, video producers, artists, music producers, and journalists with a passion for sports to help us continue to unlock the inner enthusiasts inside every casual sports fan. Thank you. Networks who own sporting rights, they're trying to do things in social media as well. And you see yourself being able to acquire those customers and keep them engaged because you, know, you might get 7,000 downloads, that's a really great start. How are you going to keep them doing their thing for three minutes or growing it to you know, 60 minutes? So, um, we've actually been lucky enough when we started uh, building this brand, it was uh, on a very, very small scale about four years ago. Um, and uh, it really only turned into uh, something a lot bigger last year, and when I joined the program, that's when it was sort of at its peak. Um, with, with to see existing growth for the past four years, uh, we almost tripled our impressions from, from last NBA Finals uh, compared to this NBA Finals. So uh, we, we, we continue to uh, grow our team. Uh, our content creation gets better. Um, we can be uh, better designers. Uh, we're building relationships with um, ESPN, obviously the NBA, so we've been able to you know, use the content ourselves. Uh, and because of that, you know, we've been able to grow our audience, and a lot of them have been coming over uh, to us, which is why the NBA you know, contact a lot of our designers uh, and ask them to do design work for them. Um, we're keeping that all in house, though, so that they can just keep coming to us. Can I ask, um, I've heard whispers through the industry about basketball programs. So is that you're doing something right? Uh, are you going to break job with that? I was a bit surprised when I first saw Frame Network and heard that. Yeah. Um, so you're obviously not here to ask for money tonight. You're yeah. here to ask for contacts. That's right. So in terms of the timeline for how you're going to grow this then, mm -hmm. what is that you're talking about? Quickly talking about soccer, which sport are you going to tap next so that we know what sort of contacts we can buy you with next? What does that look like? Yeah. So over the next nine months, we obviously want to, um, we have players ready to be released for the this season. Uh, we would like to spend some time just fine-tuning everything and making sure we get this vertical 100% right. Uh, and then after that, we're looking to break into soccer. Um, that's the next one, that's obviously the biggest market. We have a few contacts there already. Uh, and a lot of our designers and content creators um, have done some, some work uh, for the World Cup. So, because of that, uh, we think that's going to be the easiest one to penetrate next. That's fantastic. I think this works. <laughs> uh, well done, Alex. Um, sorry, your last speech in the night, I totally know how that feels. And I just missed how you make money. Yep. <laughs> so, could you just talk to me again? Because I, totally. I, was, I was caught up in your content too. Yeah, so um, we have a few different revenue streams. So, uh, first of all, and I, I touched on them briefly. But, um, 
what, we, what we're able to do is, uh, number one, advertisement is huge. So uh, the fact that we can, we can, we can bring people back uh, constantly to, to view our content um, is obviously valuable to advertisers and uh, you know, that translates to revenue very easily. And endorsements as well with players, uh, they're ha happy to represent our brand. We've, you know, we've got some, some great contacts and it's things we're looking to roll out next year. Um, and in addition to that, we develop, we, we, we uh, build our own um, online store with, with our, our social merchandise, which is rapid response, so great news. Um, comes out or, or if you trade, and we've already got the design ready, we've already got it on the show, it's originally created, so it's owned by us, we're able to sell that, um, and that's something that gets people very excited, especially the CSC, it's going to do like 2,000 of them, uh, and also we've run that once before, it sold out within two weeks, we made $35,000 in that time. So for us, those are like the biggest revenue streams, and obviously we're looking for ways to monetize our magazine, uh, and, Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Alex. So that was the eight startups. Um, uh, I'm really excited for you guys to go out and meet them in a second. But before we do that, I'm going to give you a quick update. And this is mostly a popular request about what are the other startups been doing. Um, so we've chosen just a few to highlight, and that will give a little bit of time for. Um, um, our, our, our judge over here to make the order of choice board, which we'll then announce afterwards, and then we'll break the drinks. So, a quick update, if we can. Fantastic. First of all, before I do this quick update, um, I put this photo here because I think it's a really good analogy of what we've seen tonight, which is our first week program, our community, and we're trying to build a bridge, and, and that's what we've done in the last three years. We're building a bridge. The first time founders is the people leaving the university to do their first startup and get going and launch. And we've had some fantastic results. In fact, in the last ooh, I'm in, in the in the last uh, yeah, three years we've from five hours started to a fourteen week program. Uh, you missed some texts here, but that's fine. Uh, our mentors in our last class, so this is the last class we just saw, they have donated nine hundred hours, volunteered nine hundred hours in there. I mean, that's an incredible achievement, and that's only the last four to make. In fact, if we get a round of applause from it, too. <laughs> Since last 20 days, so that's only about six months ago, our startups have actually raised, that's just increased, that it's got like, um, over $2 million. So this isn't the startups I'm going to be raising. I guarantee you that the ones coming out of the day will be raising in some form. And we have combined valuation of 23 million across our startups within the Jeff program. And this is only the beginning. We're only just getting going. So yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic news for us. <laughs> just quickly, the updates. Uh, Zuccuri, if you don't know them, there are unusable sunglasses. That's a couple of them up there. They've closed their second round of financing just under a million dollars. They've got some fantastic advisors and they're on track. <laughs> <laughs> We're on track to reach our first pair by Christmas this year. Well, Atomo, formerly Atomology, they're building a 3D mic microscope. It's a materials imaging service. Unfortunately, I cannot announce who they're working with, but they're now working with one of the leaders and biggest consumer tech companies in the world for their materials imaging service. That's fantastic news as well. Trimp Industries, from I think class two or class three, so a couple of years ago, they've just closed their first round of financing. It's also our biggest seed round ever, sort of a million dollars, it's fantastic. And that's to boost their tissue regeneration technology, which we're really excited about. And Promise Pay recently just won the Optus Innovation Social Pledging Competition. That's a social pledging platform as well, which is fantastic. A couple of movements from our founders. Jeremy of Vista recently launched his second startup, Better Wealth. You can check that out. Nicholas from Medici is now into his second startup, director of Cancer Line, a fast growing fashion company, so we know you Emily from Q is about to launch her second startup, Q, a mental health company. The Hesh from Europe for Jobs is onto his second startup, head of talent at Canada. And Sharan, uh, CTO of Europe for Jobs, is now another startup, CTO of Class Movies and Asian Tech Company. And in fact, all of those have been helping us mentor over the last batch. A big kudos to our mentors. Uh, there's too many of them to put on this slide, so I've just put a few. In particular, I'd like to say a big thank you for the continued support from Matt Byrne, Rick Baker, Chris Gable, Petra, Alfred, and Hank. 
um, our board members for class six, as well as our advisory network. And please just get one more round of applause. From <laughs> And now, if we're ready, yeah, we'd we'll love to do the Lenovo Choice, Lenovo Choice Award. Could you please invite um, and give a round of applause for Matt on to come and Thank you very, very much. Wow, a lot of highly capable and creative minds there. I've actually been sitting here with my team saying, I don't have any choice, so you know, it's much, much harder than I thought. Um, thank you very much to the judges, some great questions there, and made it much, much harder for you. I'm going to give the award to the youngest team tonight. They invested in some real pain points, they've got the customer at the centre of their solution, um, very scalable, and I'm going to wish you the best of luck for the education. In fact, um, one of the coolest things about our accelerator is that we have on average the youngest um, co-founders in you know, any accelerator program I know of is 23. That's not to say that you know um, I'm not against um, all the founders, not at all. Um, we just believe in identifying the young and helping them grow at a young age. Um, finally, there's an ask from us, which is we're always on the hunt for amazing mentors to help us. And if you see value in investing in a program like Incubate, then please come talk to me after this. Otherwise, thanks very much for coming tonight. Thank you again for sitting through eight pitches. There is some drinks and refreshments um, upstairs. So you just head out the step um, and then up the stairs across to the Charles Weber Center foyer, which is a fantastic new building. That's where the start to be going. Um, so thank you very much for coming tonight. And we look forward to seeing everyone in the next seven day. Thanks, guys. <laughs>